deep wealth, or metacurrencies and deep wealth, I think is how it was written on the program. And um, what I'd like to do is to actually keep the presentation part short so that we can have an opportunity to, to talk. So um, what my, my goal is to actually breeze through some things and uh, there's actually a bunch of technology behind the picture in this and I wasn't planning on going into the technology. I do have other presentations pulled up that have more information about that if there's questions in that domain. But uh, first, just want to be able to actually set some context for what the heck we're talking about with deep wealth and what problem we're trying to solve with metacurrency. So um, the first thing I want to do is give a little bit of a disclaimer that some of the things that I'm going to say to some of you may sound crazy and others may sound really obvious and I'm trying to kind of thread that path between the things that are a little bit out there and disruptive and things that are you know sort of obvious about what's changing. So uh, don't get too reactivated if some things sound a little bit crazy. Um, first, a little bit of context. Um, we are in the midst of an economic evolution and we kind of forget that sometimes when, you know, when we look at the kinds of things that are happening with uh, the stock markets or you know, with currencies and all of that kind of stuff and we start worrying about the, the, maybe not all of you are worrying about this, but I certainly know a number of people worrying about the stability of our existing system, feeling like it's a little bit of a house of cards ready to tumble down sometime in the not too distant future. Well, it may be that that's actually just a, a step in a process and what, what we're seeing isn't uh, you know ongoing recession or something like that. It's actually transition between economies and transitions can be painful for us humans that resist change. Um, because as you go through those transitions, the rules change, the strategies change, the architectures change, and uh, it takes something to get used to those changes. And we're seeing a lot of those those changes happening now. But first, let's look at the recent industrial age. One of the key success strategies for that age was enclose value, enclose some value, and charge for it. Whether that value is is intellectual property or a manufacturing process or you know a product or trademarks or or patents or things like that, like en enclose some value and mark this as your property. You own it. Charge for access. Make money that way. But we're seeing a significant shift afoot because of these changing architectures and patterns where there's now things that are creating new commons, new shared value, and new ways to actually share value more effectively. You know, open source software, creative commons, there's you know, Craigslist, all these different types of things exist in this space of new ways of sharing value. And for me, it's really just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Um, and the architectures are also changing. You know, we, we're all familiar with this nice corporate org chart type of look from the industrial age and moving toward this more, slightly more chaotic networked look. But uh, those changes in architecture bring other, other rippling changes in, in the strategies. Um, and one of the most important enclosures, and we said this thing about enclose some value and charge for access to it, one of the most important enclosures has been kind of hidden in plain sight, and that's money. You know, we talk about free markets and all that kind of stuff, but we don't necessarily realize that that also applies to money, that also applies to currencies, that, that we, we end up being in this position where we all create value, but money has actually become a bottleneck in our ability to share that value. I mean, you look at all of the the, the startup businesses, people with great ideas of things that they want to do, and what are they, you know, what's what's their big stopping point? You know, getting funding to get their idea going, and um, you probably have the personal experience of the, the degree to which money can be a bottleneck in uh, what you want to do. Um, I would assert that that actually goes deep, and that's that that bottleneck isn't just an issue of not having some money, but it's actually uh, deep into the design of money and, um, our, and not just money, but how we measure value. And so the problem that we're trying to solve in the Metacurrency Project is actually coming from a whole different space of looking at um, money and value. And there's this image that I talk about, about that we're basically we, hiding this mountain of wealth behind a molehill of money. And we get so fascinated with 
this creation of ours, this symbol system of money that we've created, that we end up not only losing access to, failing to access all this deeper wealth, but even breaking parts of it with the way that we manage money. So let me just give one quick little example. Um, consider a beehive. And m many of you may have heard about col colony collapse and c concerns that are happening with the uh, population of bees out there. And I've heard some people respond to that, well, you know, so what if there's a little bit of a honey shortage for a while? And um, obviously that's a really small part of the picture. You know, it's not about honey. It's actually about the fact that bees produce 80% of our food supply in the pollination process. There's this deeper value that is that they're connected to through the activities of pollinating flowers and, you know, they've got different properties to them, you, you know, and uh, they produce a byproduct of honey, a surplus of honey. And then there's a market for honey. But if we look at the relative importance of these things, that market for honey, compared to the whole food supply, is pretty insignificant. And I would assert that this is the kind of up upside downness that we have going on right now in the whole business ecosystem, is that we are looking at the market for stocks and you know, the value of, of things that, uh, the value of a business in this sort of speculative market terms, and we've lost sight of the whole value ecosystem that businesses are a part of, and that we're a part of even beyond business. So one last uh, thing in this, in this scenario is um, a way to actually talk about these deeper levels of wealth. Um, first of all, what the, the perspective that I'm coming from is actually about wealth as a living system, or not wealth as a living system, but the part that I care about is living systems and the wealth of living systems. Um, so we all are recognizing that there's limitations to um, some of the things that we're, we're doing today. Like we, you know, there, there's been, you could say that if, if man's job, if our story for, for the past couple thousand years has been that our job is to have dominion over the earth, you know, I think it's time to actually put up a little sign and say mission accomplished, right? We've that, been there, done that. Now it's actually time for a new relationship because the earth is getting a little small for our capacity to dominate it inside of our current um, structures of, of wealth. So I uh, just want to talk about this diagram here for a second. For those of you in the cheap seats in the back, you may not be able to see, down in the lower corner is uh, this little box called the economy, right? That green box down there in the lower corner is what of the whole landscape of wealth here that our current economy is able to access. And uh, let me zoom in on that. So you can see that's a, that's a really small part of the overall landscape of, of wealth that we're talking about. And if you want to set a way to relate to this personally, think for a moment about, so how many of you have had a job? You've worked for somebody else. You've been employed by somebody else. Now, in that job, what percentage of the total value that is you did your employer have access to? What percentage of your creativity, of your love, of your friendships, of your passions? Tiny, 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 tiny portion. That's the kind of thing that's going on here. When the way that we are monetizing everything around us actually has such limited capacity to access that wealth. And you can, you can see that on a personal basis, but that's the same thing going on in the whole landscape. Um, so back to the Zoom here. And uh, the momentum actually of the industrial age uh, monetary system that we've had that has been this enclosure has actually been to take things further in this direction even toward toward speculative wealth because if you look at where the bulk of the wealth is I actually took this out of the sequence of slides but I just decided to put it back in um, you know the bulk, bulk of liquidity is way up in all of this gambling stuff and so little in the actual productive economy anymore that it's it's kind of scary how out of balance the system is. You can see how, how tipsy that, that diagram looks. So let's translate this, though, into terms that actually mean something. And again, I'm going to stick with you as a human as an example. 
So every living system has all these layers to it. We have parts and products, physical parts and products, and also the byproduct of our creativity. Most of the time, the way that humans are monetized are luckily not as parts and products, not chopped up into pieces, the way that we may monetize cows or things like that. But the way humans are typically monetized is labor, byproduct of your creativity or skills and, and that kind of thing. So that all operates at the level of tradable wealth, which is the only place that scarcity is even relevant and the only part that the economy even begins to access a piece of, because, well, come back to that. Then as we go into deeper levels, we have properties of systems. So, sorry, you as a human obviously have uh, skills and that kind of stuff that you can, can uh, provide, but let's just stick with you as a physical entity. You've got, um, you could, for example, donate blood. If you have adequate nutrition, you, you have the ability to produce more blood than you need, right? So you can sell plasma or donate blood. That's, that's like looking at you as parts and products. You can donate a liver, you can donate bone marrow, there, there's, right? You can see that in the overall picture of the wealth that is you, that's pretty superficial. Um, but if we start, if we take this whole cardiovascular system analogy further, performance of systems is, um, that'd be more like your blood pressure. Right, that's a, a real time, oh I skipped properties, that'd be like your blood type. You can't trade your blood type, right? You can, the blood you donate is of your type, but you can't ever trade your blood type. Performance of systems would be more like your blood pressure. Obviously you can't trade your blood pressure, and that changes real time, moment to moment. Um, relationship between systems would be like your overall cardiovascular health. Evolutionary capacity of systems is like the ability for you to modify yourself at one of those other layers either through help, through assistance, like you know, um, uh, a pacemaker or a valve transplant or something like that, or even through training. Suppose you want to change your performance, you want to be able to train for a marathon, and you actually intentionally, you, you use your intelligence about these different levels of systems to alter the capacities at those different levels. Um, it's actually possible to have economies that go into all of these levels and currencies that operate at all of these levels. The problem is they're not currencies in the way that we think of money. They're currencies in a way that we, we have to kind of reclaim the word to be something more akin to its roots. It comes from the Latin carrere, to run, to flow. And currencies, as it turns out, um, at least the way I use the word, and I'm, I'm trying to evangelize this use a little bit, is um, Currencies are symbol systems that we create for managing flows, for managing currents. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in money is a kind of symbol. It's just a number on a piece of paper or in a bank account or you know that kind of thing. It's literally just a symbol that we use to, ex to enable certain kinds of exchange, certain kinds of flows of exchange, right? Well, there's a whole lot of other types of currencies that we use at, to get access to some of these other levels. Like, um, let's jump all the way up to the nameable wealth level uh, of relationships between systems, just, because, just to keep things moving along. Do you remember when food was just food? It was just food. It wasn't locally grown, fair trade, GMO free, you know, hormone free, um, free trade. You know, a free range, cage free, like all, all of grass fed, <laughs> all, all the types of things that we now throw these labels on food. In the sense of nameable currencies, that those are examples of the kinds of things that we do to actually make value visible at the level of relationships between systems. If you're somebody who actually cares about whether or not the food that you're buying is poisoning the ecosystem or potentially poisoning you or something like that because of, of uh, pesticides and fertilizers and stuff like that, you may actually care about organic. But when you're holding one apple in, in a hand and another apple in a hand, there's, you can't see this apple's $2, this apple's $3, these are kind of pricey apples, but um, you, know, there's, you can't see that part of the process anymore. So what we do to make those flows visible to us is we create ways of labeling uh, those parts of the process and certifying those things. So what this starts to do is create whole new kinds of signals about demand and supply and process and value and quality 
that we're not used to thinking of as the kinds of signals and economies. And you remember that diagram with the nice ordered hierarchy and the little crazy network? Well, pretty much everything that we know about economics is on that nice ordered hierarchy side that's, that's through artificial scarcity of, of currencies been one particular pattern. And as we create new kinds of, of capacities among ourselves to actually mark value and create our own currencies for that value in distributed ways, networked ways, um, that is whole new terrain that we don't know much about in economics. Um, so the Metacurrency Project, um, I maybe should have said what, what it is at the beginning, but I didn't. Um, we're actually building the tools that we see as the platforms for the next economy, for us to be able to um, do all those things that I just said in terms of agree what we value and how we're going to interact around it through, because all of those agreements get embedded actually in currencies and how we transact with them. Um, I can go deeper into the actual tools that we do that with. But what I want to do is actually just stop and find out if that's where people are interested in going or people would, would rather talk about this or if you have other kinds of questions. Does anybody have any questions? Somebody, we've got a microphone also that will come around to you if you have one kind of question. Yeah. Well, uh, hang on one second. Uh, I guess maybe my question would be a good segue for the talking about some tools, but one of the issues uh, is, uh, you know, you sh in terms of the charge from hierarchies to, to networks, is the fact that uh, networks are also actually extremely expensive to maintain uh, because at the level of communication, for example, we, we use humongous amounts of energy. And so, uh, you know, I think we need to also talk about the realistic notions about the cost of this. In other words, uh, that uh, we are not moving from you know a materialistic uh, economy to a fantastically you know virtual economy. I mean, it's just simply another form of materialistic economy, uh, at least as it looks like right now. But I guess um, part of the question will be ultimately. Um, what tools are you thinking of, and what what conceptions of, of wealth that you see that are not really a capturable within the uh, taxonomy that we have now, and uh, also the fact that they they shouldn't be capturable in, in the taxonomy that we have now, because the point would be not to have those taxonomies. Um, so some examples of the the kind of wealth that I'm that I'm talking about. Um, it, it's interesting, I've actually interviewed some people about how they experience wealth and you get some interesting answers, like Craigslist, for example, as a whole other kind of source of wealth. But when you consider, um, for example, a suburban neighborhood in the United States, you know, where you've got 40 homes that have 40 lawnmowers that they use for six months out of the year for maybe an hour a week or something like that. And uh, in terms of the current economy and how we, we do things, that's really great if we can get everybody to buy a lawnmower, even better if it breaks in two years and they buy another one, you know, like that's great. That's really great for the economy. It sucks for the planet. It sucks for your personal budget. It, it sucks in a lot of ways. And there's really no reason why if we didn't have other kinds of signals. There's no reason why we couldn't have other kinds of signals to, for example, have those 40 homes be able to pretty effortlessly share two or three lawnmowers. And, or, you know, better yet, is the conversation about really why do we have lawns and, and that kind of thing. But even if we don't go there, if we just look at the simple resource use question, we have, we live inside of this sort of scramble to, to get the, the rent money for this month, and, you know, to pay the bills this month, and there's sort of like this hamster wheel cycle that most people live in. And if you started looking at the glut of resources that are around us in people's garages and basements and all that kind of stuff, just 
not very well matched to where the need is. It's not about materialistic or immaterialistic. It's actually about higher efficiency. We've got this mythology that a market that's driven inside of this tradable wealth domain where ownership is the, the, the determining factor. You have to be able to extract the value from the system to be able to trade it. And the thing is that when we extract value, we break parts of those systems. You know, when you trade pounds of beef, you break cows. And I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't ever do that, but when the only thing that we make visible uh, is when we measure only at that extractable layer, and we don't see all of the kinds of wealth that are deeper in those relationships, um, we don't facilitate those things. And we don't facilitate um, the, the flow of, of resources to where the needs actually are. And we think that we're living in an efficient economy by doing that. Um, and what I'm suggesting is, yes, there's costs to networks. Um, but the efficiencies that emerge from them are also on a totally different scale than the ones that come through through hierarchy. Well, but e efficiency. Someone else is uh, yeah. yeah, I'm. I'm interested in hearing more about meta currency and what specifically. What you know? What's the details? What exactly have you put together? Um, we have. Um, a few different iterations. First of all, one of the, let me just start by saying one of the places that we're addressing this issue is at the level of technology. That um, it's it's not because we think technology is the answer to all human problems. It's because I th we have a lot of skills interacting with each other on this scale, on the scale of a, of a village or something like that. But when it comes to the kind of scale that our economy is on, it, it ends up taking technology to be able to facilitate things at that scale. And our technology is part of what keeps us stuck in these patterns. Um, so we've actually done a few different iterations of things. We, we release all of the things that we build as open source tools, at, you know, basically in the spirit of the, the kinds of values that we're talking about here. Um, and uh, we, so we have a couple of iterations of tools about doing this, and the current iteration that we're on is challenging to talk about in terms of normal computing architectures. Like the kinds of things that I would say to you that it is sound a little fantastical, um, and yet it's where we've ended up in our design, that we end up having kind of a, a self-describing computing protocol stack that uh, also enables kind of universal APIs where data can be shared at, at any level, across all levels. And um, that our strategy for this, let me just jump real quick to a different screen. Oops, we have tweets showing up on here. I forgot to turn that stuff off. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Art, can I ask a related question as you go into this? Yeah, yeah. Because what you're saying could account. be also just around the, the application of our Bali networks, because I'm, as you know, very keen on how we can apply this in the day. As you know, Art, what you're talking about now may be um, added to as you're talking about of the, uh, of the application in the Bali networks, because uh, as you know, I'm very much interested in finding a system we can bring to LA for our business network there. Um, so what we're doing in the Metacurrency project ends up being this really grand plan, but it starts with communication tools, um, solving what would seem like a, an unrelated problem to currencies, um, solving the, um, the information overload that, that we experience by having you know, emails coming in from different accounts and text messages and you know, phone calls and voicemails and you know, all the different places that, that we have information coming in to us and how difficult it is to manage those in a coherent stream. You know, when I say, oh, Dan sent me this phone number last week. Wait, was that in an email? Was that a Skype chat? Was that, where was that? And, you know, it takes me 10 minutes just to find the right channel of communication to find the phone number. And um, so we're, we're actually starting there because what that puts in place is the communication protocols um, in in a way that people begin to have um, 
tools to start operating in a peer distributed network. Um, the level of, of um, change that we're talking about is in the self-describing protocol stack, the ability to uh, actually bypass, um, for example, IP addresses and that kind of stuff. For now, we have to go on the internet protocol because that's, that's what's out there, that's what's routed. But um, having this whole fractal architecture for, you start with addressing issues with communications, managing flows at that level, then group intelligence and decision making, and then we actually get to currencies because um, for us, currencies are actually a group managing an agreement about what they value and how they want to interact or transact around what they value. And if you can't solve the, transa the transaction and the interaction problem and the uh, issue of managing agreements, then you actually can't have shared currencies. Um, the one other thing to, to, to note about this, the reason that I said earlier that it's about decentralized technology is that really part of what we're modeling in this whole process is nature. There's kind of a big biomimicry lesson in the mix. And if you think about the intelligence, we have a funny definition of intelligence, right? We think that it's about this linear, rational, logical stuff. And yet the cells in our body, for example, construct these amazingly complex architectures and they coordinate ridiculously sophisticated action without a boss cell, without this kind of hierarchy. It's all a networked type infrastructure. But one of the things that was required for them to do that is they had to develop, cells actually had to develop a kind of language for coordinating this. And so they have signaling systems and things that we might actually, we in the Metacurrency project might actually think of as currencies that are flowing through the body carrying those communications. But more importantly, they actually each carry a set of the agreements in DNA, right? They each carry a copy of their own agreements. And so part of the, the way that this is all structured is everybody, when, when a group of people decide this is what we value, how we're going to interact with, with, with around it, they each, each can carry a copy of that agreement um, literally in, in code and interact with each other through their own copy thus there being no centralized control. Okay, we just have a couple last minutes for questions. If so on, on the ground in LA, we've got a business network, as you have in Denver, right. and there's eight, just for everyone's context, we're both, I met Art at the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies Conference four or five years ago, where there's 80 networks of businesses that are all about place-based economies, and our, yours is in Denver, mine's in Los Angeles, we have 4,500 people on our email list and we'd like to launch a complementary currency system, but to manage that effectively needs a very sophisticated online system, as you're aware. And I'm casting about trying to find such a system. How close are you to be able to deliver something that, for example, I could use in Los Angeles? Um, I wouldn't look to the Meta Currency project for that, mm -hmm. but my software company, The Geek Gene, that actually makes currency systems for people has mm -hmm. built things like that, and in the Denver network, we're uh, launching a bunch of capital programs this year, including some that involve a local currency, so we should talk later yes. about that. Thank you. One more question? Anything really far out there? Because this is a little bit far out there. <laughs> Nothing? Okay, I've got a far out question. Do you mind if I ask a third question? So a lot of the discussion in the complementary currency world is, okay, we have hundreds of currencies around the planet, but there's that meta, meta currency discussion of how do we create a federation and an exchange system? I have 20,000 Bernal bucks and I want to go to the Berkshires and Berkshires and start going there and spending, but how do we manage the system? If I come up with 20,000 Bernal bucks, how is that going to, is that going to crash the system in Berkshires? Those are the kinds of situations that we need to look at as far as managing the flows between networks and there has to be an information sophistication in each network to be able to have an understanding of their own system to know whether or not new money can come in and out, right? So that's a level of internal intelligence and external intelligence and network intelligence across the board. So three layers of, layers of information flows. How are you looking at that next level of kind of a federation of currencies and how there's a flow between all of them? Unfortunately, that's not a question that, that I can give a 20-second answer to. Yeah. Um, 
but the the sh the shortest answer is that um, it has to do with making it really easy for people to, to manage and do and build variations themselves and also having a lot of reputational components where there's a lot of ratings and feedback and and um, a lot of transparency so that you have other eyes looking into the system and, and giving feedback about whether it's being well managed and those can end up being indicators about how you might want to set exchange rates or things like that. But again, we're not focused primarily on exchange as currencies. In fact, that's why there's a Reputation is easy because reputation is also a big part of the currencies that we're managing. Thank you. All right. So next up, we've got Arno and the slow money people. Okay, thank you.